New York, 1977. The city was paralyzed with fear. A serial killer was on the loose, shooting young women. A lone killer with no motive is almost impossible to find, especially in a place like New York. 300 detectives were looking for him in the biggest manhunt in the city's history. The boss was a cop called Joe Barelli. This is his story of the search for the son of Sam. A Saturday night in January 77. Just after midnight, a young couple, John Deal and Christine Freud, parked up in a quiet street in Forest Hills, Queens. Okay. I'm gonna sleep over in my place. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> oh my god. This was no routine homicide. The shooting was the start of a six month long ordeal for the police and the city. I have never in my life seen a bunch of guys that were more dedicated to a case than the group that worked on this case. 23 years after the investigation, Borelli is back together with two of the men he worked most closely with. Joe Coffey, then a sergeant with 30 years police work behind him, and Marlon Hopkins, a homicide detective from Queens. I was a captain in charge of the three homicide zones, and it was close to the end of the tour, I think it was close to midnight, and I was on my way home. On the journey, Barelli caught a call on the police radio describing the mysterious shooting of a young girl in Queens. I had heard about the shooting. Now, normally, we had a lot of shootings, but this was in Forest Hills, which is a very exclusive part of Queens. And when I got there, naturally, Christine Freund had uh, been taken to the hospital. She is still alive. I was this close to being home, Joe. Sir. Okay, we got he was met at the scene by Sergeant Joe Coffey, who told him how Christine Freud had been shot twice in the head. Detective Marlon Hopkins had just found some crucial evidence. He brought me around to the car and he showed me this spent round, and it was an enormous piece of lead that was lying on the windshield, and it looked like an awfully large caliber bullet. Christine Freud was taken to Kings County Hospital with massive head injuries. While she fought for her life, detectives questioned boyfriend John Deal, but could find no motive. Back at the scene, Joe Borelli met a fellow detective. What do you make of it, Joe? Pat Moynihan. Pat Moynihan had responded also, and he was with the precinct detectives. Listen, Cap, we've had a couple of shootings around here with very large caliber bullets. A 44 caliber bullet. Two girls were shot. Borelli was told it was a string of 44 caliber shootings, one involving a detective's daughter. And she was parked up just like these two. And that's when uh, it appeared that uh, things were a little bit more than they seemed at the time. It wasn't an individual shooting. I had never run into a, a homicide with a 44 caliber bullet before. You know, that's a big bullet. All right, I want everybody who was on those cases. Borelli called a meeting with the detectives who dealt with the other 44 caliber shootings for the next day. Still no calls. Borelli hoped to get a statement from Christine in the hospital. Mr. and Mrs. Freund? But she'd never utter another word. This was now a homicide and Borelli's case. Call it. Time of death, 1.05 a.m. Hey, George. Early that same morning, Varelli sent Sergeant Joe Coffey to see the precinct's ballistics expert. It looks like you got yourself a real psycho here. Okay, tell me a little more. He says, I'm telling you, you have a psycho here. He says, I can't prove it. This is when you have a psycho. Well, it's a 44, it's very unusual, happened in a different area. Let's put them on a microscope and see if there's any uh, similarities or any connection. 
It was. Because the Charter Arms Bulldog gun was so unusual. Yeah. Remember, it was for the Sky Marshals. Right. They, they manufactured that for the Sky Marshals. And he was hanging his hat on that. He says, this is an unusual gun. This is not a gun you're going to find anyway. This has to be the same person. He says, it has to be a lunatic out there doing this. This is like a serial killer we have. A lone gunman, a 44 caliber, although the bullets weren't matched at that time, it seemed strange that we'd have three shootings, two in the Queens and one in Bronx, and with the same caliber gun. But again, you know, you don't want to make any assumptions, so you wait. Right after the Christine Freund homicide, I was in my little office, which was in the 15th homicide, and the phone rang and I picked it up and there was a male Hispanic speaking and he was, he insisted, please, I'm not crazy, don't hang up on me. Please, don't hang up. But my wife has these powers as he described it. Look, I don't have time for this. She's a psychic. And I could hear this woman in the background. She was kind of like in a trance. And he's deciphering and he's translating. The words were, he's going to strike again. This is a street, but it's not exactly the street. It's on a street, but it's not a street. It's in a park, but it's not a park. And the car is too tall. Red and black. And, and a boy and a girl, and they're gonna be killed. So, you know, I took the information down, and I, you know, I had received a few calls through the years from people like this, so I kind of didn't think too much of it. A short time after that call, we got a call of a homicide in Forest Hills again. Virginia Voskerichin was slain only half a block from where Christopher Horn had been killed only five weeks earlier. Police are saying that the man apparently walked up to And there was uh, Virginia lying on the sidewalk, and she's uh, I think it was like from here across the street to where Christine Freund had gotten killed. And it wasn't anything like the woman described on the phone. Although the murders seemed different, there was no doubt this was the same killer. Virginia had raised her books to protect herself and slowed the bullet down enough to give Borelli's team the first concrete ballistic evidence at the base of her skull. This is the third woman to be killed in the hands of the man that police are calling a crazed woman hater. Now there was no question. A serial killer was loose in New York. The press were linking the killings. The police had to go public. On March 10th, Borelli had to take the stand with Chief of Detectives John Keenan and Mayor Abe Bean. This was an election year, and the mayor needed it solved fast. He was trailing in the polls. Uh, this was the biggest thing that happened in the city of New York and who knows when. So you knew that this was a very highly politicized situation. We believe the shootings are the work of a uh, single individual. This the chief issued a warrant for the arrest of the man the press would soon call the 44 caliber killer. It is for a white male, 25 to But descriptions were vague. Six foot tall, medium build with dark hair. A 44 caliber a Charter Arms Bulldog is the weapon used in at least three of these uh, shootings. Is there a reward on this guy's head? Is there a link at all between any of the... The chief had issued a warrant for any white male aged between 25 and 35. It could have been anybody. Every day we had to accomplish something in the investigation, and that isn't the way investigations go. There was a constant hounding from the press and the, the media. Captain Borelli, what about the motives? Does he target women? Oh, look, all he's shooting is girls. Draw your own conclusions. And then there would be a rumor that uh, we had a suspect, and gee, they would descend on us like bees after honey. With nothing to narrow their search, detectives would have to deal with thousands of calls naming potential suspects. Each one would have to be manually processed. For every single call into this incident room, no matter how stupid the caller sounds, you fill out one of these forms. You always have the and crank call, you know, I'm the guy and uh, can't catch me. Uh, the crackpots, we call them. And why do you think your husband did it? If some reporter had interviewed him, or someone that. said that he felt the killer was impotent, yeah. we'd no, get 100 no, calls. People Man, giving up impotent down. boyfriends or husbands or whatever. He those things down. were crazy, but I mean, that's exactly you. what was going on. This is the latest police composite. It reflects thousands of hours of investigations and interviews with scores of possible witnesses. This picture is being distributed all over New York City in an attempt to apprehend this man. 
Uh, quite obviously, uh, we can't take that sketch and go out and pick out the person we're looking for. Uh, Chief of Detectives it, it John Keenan decided that, uh, to release a sketch uh, of the killer, even though it was uh, known to be vague. Or some friend of his may be able to come forward and say, this looks like the man we're looking for. Chief. While police have been working on his physical characteristics, psychiatrists have been attempting to sketch a psychological profile to learn more about him. To feed a hungry press, the chief also released a profile of the killer. It would generate even more false leads for the task force. At the request of Joe, who was looking for any kind of lead he can get in narrowing down the personality, what we did was typical to crime scene analysis. We tried to evaluate what was there. Since there was no evidence, that indicated somebody that wanted a cat and mouth game with the police. Harvey was a police officer, but he was a psychologist. And he prepared a profile of what he thought the shooter was. We gave him all the information on the prior incidents, thinking that maybe it was the same guy. The first thing I said to Joe that we're dealing with a psychopath. This is the kind of guy that has no conscience, has no feeling for other people, uses people to satisfy his own needs, he needs immediate gratification, he can't wait. Uh, don't tell me what you're gonna do for me tomorrow, tell me what you're gonna do for me now. Of all the experts that we had subsequent, when the case got really big, and they brought in these renowned people, no one came as good as Harvey's original profile. So what he does has to be very dramatic, uh, very flashy, and he needs that immediate feedback, for example, from the media, or from the police reaction to what he does. The man New York's detectives were looking for was a nondescript 23-year-old with no close friends and no real identity. He believed a demon called Sam Carl was ordering him to go out and kill. In his fantasy life, he was the son of Sam, a servant of the devil, and at his next killing, he'd leave a letter to Barelli describing his strange satanic world. I got a call from the chief detective's office saying that they had a, a shooting up in the Bronx and uh, it looked like the, uh, it was our guy, the 44 caliber. Right. How do they know it's our guy? And they told me there was a letter that was addressed to me. Right over. I responded up to the Bronx and it was on the Hutchinson River Parkway, which is a major parkway in the city of New York but it was on the service road, the road that leads down. It's all tree-lined. So as soon as I got to the scene, I, I, I got taken back, and I recalled Mrs. Rodriguez's phone call. It's a street, but it's not exactly a street. It's gonna be on a street, but it's not a street. There was a male and female, both killed, in the car, and the car was red and black. The son of a shot them both in the head. A boy and a girl. The couple were identified as Valentina Siriani and Alex Esor. 20-year-old Alex was a tow truck driver. His girlfriend, Valentina, an 18-year-old aspiring actress. She lived just a block from the shootings. Her parents could have heard the shots. The killer had tossed his letter to Borelli onto the lap of one of his victims. He was beginning to enjoy his notoriety. Jeez, the guy's writing me a letter. Now he's making it personal. Although the letter was never published, enough would be disclosed to send a fresh wave of fear through New York and give the 44 caliber killer his new name, the Son of Sam. The city of New York was uh, paralyzed with fear uh, by the second or third killing. And part of the reason for that was this killing had all the elements of terrorism uh, in that every citizen in the city felt that they could possibly be a victim. So it wasn't something that happened someplace else as you read about it and it's over, but it's something that could happen to you tonight, tomorrow when you least expect it. The night before last night, I have two sisters and a brother and they ran outside and they grabbed me and they brought me in the house and they're younger than I and they were really afraid. But they weren't like, I won't even sit outside my house or anything. I'm really scared. People in the neighborhood, they see somebody that, uh, that doesn't look familiar and everything, they get very suspicious, you know. So uh, everybody's got their eye out. If they can help in any way, they're going to help. I've been watching everybody, watching every move he's making, been covering my hair, changing the ways I've been doing normal life, you know, like parking and things. You don't, I don't you know, do that anymore. 
For the next four months, this strange signature and the name Son of Sam would be the focus of thousands of headlines as New York City waited for his next killing. April 77, New York's reeling from the latest 44 caliber killings. Valentina Siriani and Alex Esau were shot in their car in the Bronx. And in the last six months, Son of Sam has murdered three other young women. The city was desperate for the serial killer to be caught. Varelli hoped a letter left at the last murder would give him the break he needed, but he'd have to wait 24 hours for forensics to check for prints. We found that there were a number of latent fingerprints on the letter. Whose latent prints they are were, of course, uh, we didn't know at that particular time. Unless you had a suspect, you would have to go through the fingerprint files finger by finger to see if you could make an identification. Thanks for letter, Captain. Luckily enough, they were still able to develop a partial palm print from the letter, the first forensic evidence unique to the killer. We now had something concrete, physical evidence. We had some prints and we had his handwriting. Whether he was contriving the handwriting, we're not too sure. Jimmy was pretty sure that he was trying to fake it and writing like, if you ever notice in cartoons the way they print, it's very similar to that. And I think he started off the letter by saying, Captain Borelli, I'm not a woman hater, but he spelled woman, W-E-O. I think it was deliberate on his part to misspell it. I'm deeply hurt by you calling me a woman hater. I'm not, but I am a monster. I am the son of Sam. When Joe first showed me that letter, my immediate reaction was, this is a guy that's trying to build a reputation for himself so that he'd be known that his name would be recognized. Uh, when people heard his name, they'd be frightened. Uh, it would show he was powerful and he had an identity. Being an anonymous killer would not give him any satisfaction. And the letter was designed to give the police uh, a variety of incoherent leads, which he knew would lead them no place. And at the same time, create the impression that there was something psychiatrically wrong with him so that he was unpredictable. The women of Queens are the prettiest of all, Mr. Borelli. I don't want to kill any more, but I must honor my father. Please let me haunt you with these words. I'll be back, I'll be back, I'll be back. To be interpreted as bang, bang, yours in murder, Mr. Monster. Descriptions. Fearing mass hysteria, the police held back past. most of the letter, saying uh, only he'd contacted an officer. Advice. With uh, no real progress in the investigation, the all the chief could tell the press is to, that women uh, should avoid people, darkened or, streets. Or people, to stay out of dark areas late at night. All right, I'm afraid when I'm alone with one of my friends, but I got plenty of people here. And I'm not that afraid because I got a crowd. But um, otherwise, I'd, I'd be afraid. Of course I'd be afraid. He's a sick guy. He'd kill any time. Since he did have these problems with women, it was very unlikely that he'd be married and he'd probably live alone. It would be unlikely for him to work with other people. So he would do some kind of isolated job where he handled objects, not people. It's like, this guy's got to be caught. He really does. He's got to be either tortured slowly, or he's got to be put away. Borelli's hey. right team was so desperate to catch the killer, sometimes competition would get the better of them, and tempers would fray. I would imagine a lot of them almost wound up in the divorce court. Why don't you do it? Why don't you do it? I will do it. To make matters worse, New York experienced three days of blackouts, but Borelli had his own problems to deal with. I think there was a tremendous impact on my family, you know, my wife and the girls. Just a lot of times they didn't go home for, for 36 hours and all. Hey, a cop's wife, uh, you put up with a lot of things, especially in the detective division, all the crazy hours, you know. Friend of the kids holding out okay? Yeah, she's fine. Patience of a saint. I didn't eat dinner with my family for a long time, you know, because you'd go in and you'd come back and you're, you're cold and you're going in. And 12 hour days were, were eating, they were easy, 12 hours. That was an easy day. Your father told me he's coming home. So it was tough. It was a tough time. As the letter was sent to him, Barelli feared that he and his family were being stalked. I had a sense somebody was telling me, but I couldn't make it. So I never went home the same way twice. 
I always found a different route to go home. Well, squaring a block is if you make four left-hand turns or four right-hand turns, you're going the same way you started. Now, if somebody is doing the same thing you are, they have no intention of going any place except where you're going. You're heightened, you're aware, you're concerned. And uh, so you bring it home with you. You can't leave it at the uh, station house. Your family life suffers. You may get toward the end, you maybe get a little snappy with your wife and your children, and, and it's all stress. He would just get more and more quiet, I think. That's the way my dad dealt with the stress and with not knowing and with the management of the men that are working under him. And I think the more intense it got, the quieter my dad became and the more um, introverted. And you wouldn't, you didn't really know how to read him. My mom, you know, more or less knew what was going on, but we didn't know, you know, as um, teenagers, you know, you just know that your dad is like in a bad mood or he's not talking, but you don't really know why, because you don't know what's going on because my dad wasn't the type to tell you anything. They didn't go anywhere without talking to me first. Uh, and their mother was right after them, you know. Sometimes my dad would come home and then sort of try to, um, install himself once again into the family, yelling at you not to, where are you going, and what time are you coming home, and who are you going with, and you sort of resent that. I'll be home when I feel like it. What do you care? You're never home anyway. The reason I'm never home is because... It was in no mood to talk to anybody, so... I must have been a real grouch during that whole time. I don't know how they put up with me. Ten weeks passed with no shootings and no real progress in the inquiry. Borelli put 85% of the task force on the 8 p.m. to 4 a.m. shift in the hope that officers would bump into the killer. Sergeant Joe Coffey and Marlon Hopkins were to patrol Queens and the Elphas, a club in Bayside. 19-year-old Judy Placido was one of the few women who ventured out on Saturday, June 25th. Coffey and Hopkins passed the Elphas on their patrol several times that night. The son of Sam was keeping people off the streets. But Judy was determined to celebrate her graduation. Armed with her friend's driver's license as ID, she set out for the night with two friends, Debbie Volpez and Angela Delfino. They dropped into the Elphus shortly after midnight. For the next two hours, the girls drank and danced with friends, including Sal Lupo, a mechanic from Queens. Judy and Sal left the club at 3 a.m. and walked a block and a half to where Sal's car was parked. So is that your car? No, it's my brother's I car. I knew it was your brother's oh, car. Oh, come on, come on. So I lied. But it's a hot car. Look at it. Let me get in the driver's you seat. You want to drive? Yeah. Do you want to drive? Let me in. Okay, okay. It was a disco that was, uh, as we know, that was frequented by uh, young kids at those times. 1977, I had a drug culture. And as it turned out, these two kids were, they left the disco and sat in their automobile outside. You know, they were necking and what have you. When she'd gotten into Sal's car, Judy felt uncomfortable. She reminded him about the son of Sam. You never know when he's going to show up. He just shows up. The only thing that thwarted us from really considering the place more than patrolling it was the fact that it was too busy. It wasn't isolated. He hid isolation all the time. I mean, look at the club. There ain't, ain't nobody in there tonight. Any other Saturday night, you got people lined up in there. That elephant was highly trafficked. And we said, OK, we'll look at it. But we weren't convinced that he was going to hit that. And he hit that. What the hell was that? What the hell was that? What's going on? Tell us what's going on. Just, just stay here, all right? Just, no, where just, are you going? Just stay where you are. I'll be right back, OK? I'm, I'm going to be right back. Stay there. Stay there. A bullet had passed under Judy's scalp and lodged just above her temple. Attention on unit, shot fired, 45, 39, 211 street, possible casualties. Ah, oh, you're kidding me! Six different calls to 911 reported the shooting within two minutes. The sector patrol car was ordered to respond. The Omega task force picked up the call at the same time. Joe Coffey had passed the club only a few minutes earlier. He had unknowingly passed the killer's car on the Clearview Expressway. I just got the call over the air, and we backed off the entrance ramp of the uh, Clearview. He passed right by us. Is that incredible? <laughs> K-10 
Coffee and Hopkins arrived three minutes after the shooting to find Judy lying where she had fallen. <laughs> Seeing her head injuries, they decided not to wait for an ambulance. She was taken to Kings County in a patrol car. Get to the hospital now. Judy, what about you? Get out of her, man. I was in the car. She's dead. Judy Placido had been shot a total of three times in the head and neck. Miraculously, she would survive. All three shots missed her spine and failed to penetrate her skull. <laughs> Sal Lupo was lucky too. The bullet had only grazed his arm. Once again, there'd been no witnesses to the shooting. I don't know what happened, man. It was totally chaotic. I think there was a lot of anger there that he had done it again and we, you know, and we hadn't gotten much information to get a little closer to him. But uh, you know that in your mind, you know that the more times he, he shoots and kills, the more the opportunity for him to make a mistake. But then you realize you don't want anybody else killed. All right, did you see that girl with the, with the hair at the bar? It was a big interlock. On July 28, 20 year old Stacy Moskowitz went for drinks at a restaurant in Sheepshead Bay with her younger sister Ricky and a friend. There she met 20 year old Bobby Violantes, who worked in the men's clothing business. He graduated from high school that June, where he'd been voted best dressed man in Brooklyn. They had a lot to talk about. Stacy loved clothes and worked in the offices of a shoe firm in the Empire State Building. Nice to meet you. They arranged to catch a movie and some food the following Saturday. It was to be a fateful meeting. <laughs> now, nearly a year after his first killing and five months into the investigation, Varelli's team were no closer to finding the son of Sam. We figured he has to come strike on the anniversary, you know? This psycho's got to do it. And we had a tremendous amount of people working that night into the early morning hours. Although I don't think there was a lover's lane or a parking lot that secluded in the city that didn't have a police officer or a detective nearby. Frustrated by the lack of progress, Varelli and Coffey came up with a plan to try to trap the killer. They were about to ask fellow detectives to put their lives on the line. I'm looking for some volunteers. So I got, I got up one night in the task force office. I says, we want volunteers. And they all looked at me. What are we volunteering for? I said, we're going to put some people in cars, lovers' lanes, and hope that the, the suspect comes out and shoots at you. With a mannequin looking like a potential victim. So who do I have for volunteers? So they all looked at me, but you know what? They all volunteered. Thanks a lot. Three days after their first meeting, Bobby picked Stacy up as planned from her home on East Fifth Street, Brooklyn, at eight o'clock on Saturday, July 30th. Before she left for a first date, her father reminded Stacy about the son of Sam and warned her not to go parking anywhere. But Stacy wasn't worried because the rumor was that Son of Sam only went after brunettes. They planned to see New York, New York at a movie theater in Manhattan and then get some food. That same night, Sergeant Joe Coffey was one of the many task force officers parked up in Lover's Lanes, lying in wait for the Son of Sam. Because he was striking in these, uh, what they would call Lover's Lanes, you know, we decided, okay, we're gonna stake out some lovers' lanes. All right, guys, no wisecracks. <laughs> yeah, sure, Joe. <laughs> yeah. We would put the mannequins in cars in all the lovers' lanes throughout the city, basically in the Bronx and Queens. I remember when we first started using the, uh, the uh, mannequins that we got from the garment area that were donated, of course, and we were out sitting in the cars, and uh, the mannequins, normally you look at a mannequin, you're thinking of a fashion model, but these were the ugliest looking mannequins <laughs> I ever saw in my life. Oh, I must be goddamn crazy. Behind the bad jokes, they were deadly serious. Coffee and a dozen other detectives were targets, risking their lives, waiting for the killer to make a move. Look.
Don't you know the sun is Sam's around you? I should get out of here. Please! Hey, get your hands up! Borelli worked at Task Force Headquarters until 2 o'clock that night. It seemed another Saturday had passed without incident. For the majority of the force, the investigation was their life, and headquarters had become their home. Many detectives would grab a few hours sleep in the station house, only to get up and get back on the streets. Bay 17th Street, Brooklyn. Tommy Zeno had been out with his date, 17-year-old Debbie Krushenko. Debbie had long, dark brown hair, and according to the papers, that made her a target for the son of Sam. She was nervous about parking, especially on a lover's just, lane. Just let's, let's get out of the light, okay? Why? What's wrong? Because, because someone might see us. Come on. No, Tommy, please. Oh, all right. Don't be mad. <laughs> Uncomfortable under the street lamp, she made Tommy pull forward out of the light. Someone might tell us. Come here. Hey, someone might. <laughs> A few minutes later, that space was occupied by Stacy and Bobby. Cecilia Davis was out walking her dog on Bay 17th Street that night. She passed the two young couples in their cars about 2.30 a.m. She also saw a man walking in the direction of the cars. His stare made her feel uncomfortable. Two minutes later, there were shots. Barelli had arrived at his home in Lynbrook 10 minutes earlier. He got a call at 2.40. There'd been a shooting, this time in Brooklyn. A blonde girl and her boyfriend had been shot in their car. Borelli. I got the call. Joe Coffey mm -hmm. had responded, and he, uh, yeah. he said it was our guy, although we aren't absolutely right. sure. When you have a serial killer, okay. unless there's right a uh, common thread that uh, like uh, the prior victims all worked for somebody or they all went to a particular place or, so there was a common thread. Then it becomes interesting in the victim. You go into detail. But because he was a random shooter, looking into Stacy Moskowitz's background and who Jesus her friends were, I didn't, I didn't think it was gonna help us so I really didn't get involved in that at all. I saw him fire. Stacy had been rushed to hospital a few minutes earlier with massive head injuries. Her date, Bobby Violante, was shot in the face. The shooting would blind him. Borelli hoped Tommy Zeno, parked a few yards from the shooting, would be able to give a description of the gunman. He actually uh, didn't get a good look at him because according to his statement, if I recall it correctly, he actually saw the fella coming across through the rearview mirror. I think he considered himself lucky because according to his statement, he was parked right there where Stacy was parked and he had moved up a little bit uh, uh, for whatever reason. Just let's, let's get out of the light, okay? Why? What's wrong? Because, because someone might see us. And he saw this individual approach the car that uh, Stacy was in and I think he saw him go into a kind of a combat stance, point the gun straight out and fire. Although it was a quiet street, it was near a park area, and Borelli was sure there would be more witnesses. I stayed there maybe 10 minutes. We saw the guy walk over to his car and walk, maybe he was getting into it, and then walk around it and into the park. Another car pulled up behind me, and when I saw the headlights, I just pulled away, and I parked over here. I live right over here. I parked the car, and we went upstairs. Well, we heard shots, and my husband said something's going on outside, and then we heard the car horn beeping like crazy. It didn't sound like a broken car horn. He says, I'm going to go outside and see what's happening. He says, meanwhile, call the police. So I called up and I said, my husband thinks he heard shot, sh you know, can't talk, I'm so nervous. The condition of the victims is, uh, is uh, the man is holding his own. 
I understand the uh, Stacy Moskowitz uh, has suffered a cardiac arrest and is being uh, tr uh, tr given emergency treatment for that, and we just uh, are trying to check to find out the her status at this time. Chief, yeah. did you ever think this would happen in your neighborhood? No, never. I never did. This is a very quiet neighborhood. Nothing much really goes on around here. What are you going to do about it? I'm going to pray very hard and ask God to help to find this man so that this can't happen again. The death of Stacy Maskovich, the sixth victim of the son of Sam, would cause a media frenzy. Her funeral was televised while detectives stood guard in the vain hope of spotting the killer among the crowds. Bowed by grief because of their loss, our mourners now turn to you. Her date, Bobby Violante, had lost his sight in the shooting. His father didn't have the heart to tell him of Stacy's death. The best thing to say was that she's stable at this time. Will you be the one to who has to tell her that eventually? I'm going to be the one to tell her. After Stacy's death, the press turned on the NYPD and Chief John Keenan. How could the killings go on despite the efforts of thousands of police officers? The things that we look for in investigating a homicide are, are witnesses, uh, are physical evidence, and motive. Keenan, I don't know how many press conferences he gave where he constantly referred to the three things needed in an investigation and we didn't have them. The witnesses so far have been very scant and they were very uh, poor descriptions or in most cases no witnesses. The physical evidence has been limited to the fact that we know it's the same gun. Uh, and that's all. And the motive is a complete mystery to us. And that killed some time and that got him placated the press a little bit, but they constantly wanted uh, pictures of the drawings. This is making it difficult to, uh, ap to anticipate his next move. Chief, By this stage, many of Borelli's team were starting to despair. But Borelli remained confident that he'd be caught so which clown said we'll only catch him if we screw Cat. up? Cat. Hey, how you doing? I have a word with you. Okay. We had this woman come up. Mm -hmm. Detective Bill Gardello from Brooklyn Homicide had taken a statement from Cecilia Davis, the woman who'd walked past Stacy the night of the murder. She sees this guy walking up right past her. She gives her a stare. She keeps going and she sees some police officers. She'd seen someone walking down Bay 17th Street just before the shooting and spotted an officer issuing a summons for a cream car parked alongside a fire hydrant. She goes inside, closes the door. A couple minutes later, she hears the gunshots. <laughs> Whatever I find, I'll keep you posted, all right? It had taken her 10 days to build up the courage to come forward with the information. So we went looking for the summons and we couldn't find it. it took us a couple of days to get the summons. And when we did, it was issued to a particular car. Now, it was a parking summons, so there was no name on it. But when you do a, a check on the license plate, then it comes up with the name registered owner. And that's how Berkowitz's name popped up. Borelli sent two detectives from Brooklyn Homicide, Eddie Zigo and John Longo, to chase up the summons. Well, I got a call to, uh, from my boss to uh, go up to Yonkers and check out this fella who got a parking ticket. We figured. This fellow might have saw something that uh, no one else had seen, and maybe we have another witness. We got up to Yonkers, and the first thing we normally do is check in with the local police. Told them we're going to be in the area investigating a, uh, a fellow called David Berkowitz. And they did a check, and they said, no, the only thing they had on David Berkowitz, that he had a little uh, confrontation with a neighbor of his uh, called Sam Carr and that possibly uh, Sam Carr was alluding to the fact that he might have shot his dog and now my antenna was really up and now this David Berkowitz was sort of coming around to be more suspect than he would be a witness. When we got down to Pine Street we parked our uh, radio car and there was David's car parked at the curb. That's the car job. Until I walked around on the street side and I looked into the uh, back of the uh, car on the back seat, that's when I saw this duffel bag. And from the back uh, the street side, you could see the butt handle of a rifle sticking out. 
So that's when I decided, you know, I'd like to see what's in that bag. Then the little vent window was sort of loose. And I sort of pushed that window with a little force and I was able to get my hand in and open the door. When I opened the door, I immediately went to the back door and I entered the car and I put my hand inside the duffel bag and I pulled out the butt of this rifle and I pulled it out and I saw it was a semi-automatic weapon. So now I pulled out on the side and I reached in again and I felt this metal and I pulled it out and they were clips, uh, ammunition clips. But it had to be a lot of ammunition and they were fully loaded and taped together military style so you could swing them around and fire so many and, and fire the next round. And there were about seven of those. Now I go into the dash compartment and I found a uh, clip of uh, photographs that you take in a, like a five and dime store and now I said this has to be him. I put everything back in and then proceeded to go under the front seat is when I found this letter and there was a white envelope, a plain white envelope. So I then gingerly opened it, pulled out the letter and I started to read. As I'm reading, unbeknownst to me, my body started to shake. I felt the blood surging through my veins. My partner saw me, so John Longo comes running over and he says, Eddie, what, what's wrong? He says, what, are you getting a heart attack? What's up, Eddie? What's the matter? John, we got him. We got him. He says, who? We got who? I said, we got the son of Sam. This is the letter he's going to drop. The letter described Berkowitz's plan to machine gun teenagers at a nightclub in the Hamptons. Zigo's risk in breaking into the car had paid off. While Eddie Zigo went to get a warrant for Berkowitz's arrest, his partner John Longo watched the apartment with detectives Bill Gardello and John Falatico. Berkowitz stepped out of the block at 10.30 p.m. Go ahead, 75. That's him. That's him there. Okay, okay. Let's go get him. Desperate to avoid a shootout, detectives crept around the back of Berkowitz's car. Freeze! Don't move. Get out of the car. Real slow. Put your hands up on the roof. They expected a violent psychopath, but Berkowitz was calm and cooperative. You know. No. When asked to identify himself, he smiled and said, I'm Sam. David Berkowitz. It was Berkowitz's car that led police to him. It had been ticketed for being parked by a fire hydrant on the night of the most recent murder, just a few blocks from the murder scene. It was the first time in my career I would say that I was honestly a little annoyed with my superiors. Because, you know, I had gone through all that aggravation and all, and here they were up there, and nobody bothered to give me a call, you know. Cap, it's for you. Jonkers. I spoke to Eddie Zigo, and he said, it's him, we got him, we got the gun, we got everything, we got this, we got that, and everything. Borelli's superiors had totally yeah. overlooked the men who'd spent the last six months yeah, right, searching right. for the son of Sam. It, I mean, they could have at least uh -huh. said, hey, Joe, pick a couple of guys and meet us up there, you know? I would have picked some of the detectives who had the cases and gone up there with them, just to be there, you know? To see him, you know, see him firsthand. Think if I'd have had the people that were responsible for that, I, you know, I might have given them a piece of my mind in very unpolite terms. In the half hour ride down to Police Plaza, Eddie Zigo would be the first to talk to the man who had terrorized New York for six months. And he asked me, he says, why are you so quiet? Uh, so I says, oh, nothing. I says, uh, usually when something like this happens, you know, it's, uh, I usually call my wife and th this is one of the biggest things that happened to me and I can't call her because she's not here anymore. And he says, is it really that big? And I said, yeah, David, this is big. He says, uh, well, would you mind doing me a favor? I says, oh, no, what is it? He says, well, would you comb my hair? I said, what? He said, would you comb my hair? I think he said from right to left. He says, comb it from right to left, which I did. And I, I thought that was kind of weird, but I did it for him. And uh, the inspector who was sitting in the front street turned around and shook his head. He said, I don't believe you, Ed. They got him. Oh. You know, finally it was over. It was a terrible thing. I mean, people had died and all, but the relief that you felt that, hey, geez, it's over, you know? 
we can relax. <laughs> Congratulations, PD. Um, cops walking down the street, people were telling them what a wonderful job, you know, just a uniformed cop walking around. Berkowitz was far from the monster the meteor had imagined. Everybody was alerted. Word had must have gotten out, some leak or whatever it was, and everybody knew that we had him. And the press started coming, and they were all trying to get up into the chief of detective's office. If there was one, there were a couple of hundred newspaper men, television crews. It was bedlam. I mean, it really was. Received the summons. Suddenly, the everybody wanted to be associated with the capture of the son of Sam. The police department has done a superb job. But it wouldn't bring back the six young men and women he had murdered. But the nightmare's never over. She ain't coming back. He ain't bringing none of these kids back. Not only for myself, but for the other parents. I feel the same way. It's difficult to describe the relief. It was like... If somebody took a hundred pounds of lead and you, you carried it around for a year and a half, and all of a sudden somebody took that lead and lifted it off your shoulders because of all the hard work that had gone into it. I had 37 years in the police department and I have never run across a case like it. We used to sit around at night uh, sometime when there was a lull and we said to ourselves, gee, what kind of, this guy is awful bright, you know, he's, he's so smart, he's outwitted some of the best minds that in the police department. They stayed away from us, we can't catch him. And then when we finally caught him, we found out just a plain, simple Joe, you know, soulful looking guy that everything he did was just accidental. After his arrest, Berkowitz admitted to the killings, saying he'd been possessed by demons in the hope he'd be judged unfit to stand trial. When the killer was caught, I was not surprised because the way he acted because he did the typical thing that a psychopath does. He surrendered without a fight. He immediately tried to create a defense for himself, a psychiatric defense by acting crazy. He immediately, from the first instance, started to manipulate the situation. All the detectives that had assigned cases like Marlin and uh, some of the others, they started interviewing him. But during one of the breaks, I walked in because I was curious. And I looked at him and he looked up at me and he had a little smile on his face. And I asked him if he knew me. And he said, yeah, he said, you're Captain Borelli, I sent you a letter, you know? I didn't know whether to smack him in the face or what to do with him at that time, but I just walked out shaking my head. You know? Berkowitz was brought to court in an eight vehicle motorcade. Police know people are angry. They're afraid of violence. Berkowitz himself was in a special steel-plated prison van. Berkowitz would ultimately admit to the six murders, but there were conspiracy theories that he'd acted as part of a satanic group. Right after the, uh, the arrest was made, uh, there was an awful lot of thought that it, he was part of a conspiracy, there were others involved, and uh, I never bought into that. He knew intimate details of every incident. And that made, and I'm absolutely convinced that he acted alone. But 23 years on, victims' families still think others were involved. But Borelli has put that behind him. He's retired and moved out of the city to Long Island. I forgot about all the aggravation that I, that I had gone through. It took me the longest time after I retired to come down to just relaxing after being involved with this city for 37 years. Now it, uh, it's just a memory, but at that time, it was a terrible situation to be in. At the expense of uh, the tragedy of all those young people being killed, what I would imagine, and I know it's a fact, that after the case was over, my career kind of took off and, and uh, throughout my time in the department, I was always associated with the uh, son of Sam. Borelli went on to become New York's chief of detectives, one of the most senior jobs in the police department. David Berkowitz was given six life sentences, a total of 350 years, and expects to die in prison at the Sullivan Correctional Facility.